thanks for coming. Um, I'm happy you guys could make it in the weather. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Wendy Redstar here today. Um, I'm not going to go through the full like litany of all your shows <laughs> because it just becomes a gloss and it's hard to absorb, but there's a lot. Um, but I just wanted to um, give a orientation about her work. Um, Wendy Redstar works across disciplines to explore the intersections of Native American ideologies and colonialist structures, both historically and in contemporary society. Raised on the Crow Reservation in Montana, Red Star's work is informed both by her cultural heritage and her engagement with many forms of creative expression, including photography, sculpture, video, fiber arts, and performance. An avid researcher of archives and historical narratives, Red Star seeks to incorporate and recast her research, offering new and unexpected perspectives in work and work that is at once inquisitive, witty, and unsettling. Intergenerational collaborate, collaborative work is integral to her progress, uh, pro, sorry, practice, along with creating a forum for the expression of Native women's voices in contemporary art. And, so, and she's exhibited across the United States, internationally, as well, um, with many museum shows and, and um, shows at various institutions of higher education. So without any further ado, please welcome Wendy Redstar. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been super exciting day waking up with the weather. My mom in Colorado texting me, oh my god, it looks awful over there. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for um, braving the weather. And I want to thank the art department and the faculty and staff and Teresa for bringing me out. It's a great honor. Um, when I was in undergrad, I went to undergrad at Montana State University in Bozeman. And my parents bought me this used um, Subaru sports car, which I thought was super cool. And it had a brown university sticker on it, and I just kept it on there. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to, you know, my first time here in Rhode Island. To, now it's legit. Um, but yes, thank you so much. And I had a wonderful time um, visiting with the students. It's always fun to see what uh, students are into keeps me on top of things. I might take some of your ideas, incorporate them into my own work, but um, thank you very much. I, I want to start out with a few like most recent projects. Um, there's an exhibition that's currently up in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, the title of the show is called The Maniacs. We're not the best, but we're better than the rest, and it's about um, my father and his musical history, starting from his childhood, at the age of five, he was trained as a classical guitarist, and then um, he went on to join the Marines, and when he was in the Marines, he started a band there called the Maniacs, um, and they, pretty incredible, the, the Marines let them um, play for two weeks to raise money for a Jerry Lewis telethon, and they raised like $50,000. Um, and then when he finished his time with the Marines, he moved back to the reservation, and he started uh, the band again, but this time with cousins and his uh, brothers, and um, again called it the Maniacs. So what you're seeing is uh, an image, a promo image for them, um, of the reservation of maniacs. Their uh, mascot was a goat. And uh, the show consists of all um, found uh, family images. And a lot of conversation, my dad's still alive, he's 76. A lot of conversation, phone conversations with him kind of back and forth. And the reason why I wanted to do this exhibition um, is because I, I grew up kind of knowing about the maniacs um, and thinking, the, thinking of them as being sort of this legendary band. And there are no recordings um, of the maniacs. Um, and I'll have <laughs> tribal members who attended their concerts come up to me and say uh, they remember them. And uh, one person said, the white people had the Beatles 
but the Crows had the mania. <laughs> and so they were a cover band. They were known to play over uh, 300 songs. And this is my dad um, during his time at Camp Pendleton um, and about to go to Vietnam. And he joined the Marines when he was about to turn 18. He dropped out of high school. And then he got his GED. And so uh, it starts out with this timeline. Uh, during the opening, Las Cruces was a great place to have it. I wasn't really, I was just excited about the space, how large it was, uh, because I wanted to create sort of this rock and roll hall of fame for them. Um, but not really thinking about uh, the big military community that Las Cruces has. And uh, during the opening, there was a Marine there, and he came up to me and he said, you know, I went to Camp Pendleton a few years after your dad, so all of these images, you know, with the big helmet, I have those same images. And I got to talking to him, and he's like, and I see that your dad's an expert sharpshooter. I said, what? <laughs> and he pointed out the medal that he has that proves that he's this expert sharpshooter. Kind of creepy to think of your dad, like, expert sharpshooter. Um, not only do I want to talk about my dad and his musical history, but I also wanted to talk about my Uncle Wendell, who is my namesake, and he was the bass player for the band, and uh, the, the band ended because my uncle uh, passed away, and he was only 22 when he passed away. Um, and then my dad buried his guitar in my uncle's casket and pretty much stopped playing. So occasionally when I was little, um, if there was a guitar around, my dad would play it, and I would hear him playing songs, and I could kind of see him going back um, in time to this very like happy place. And an another thing is my aunt had a majority of these images, these sort of promo shots, so um, she, um, towards the end of her life, gave me those images. And so my Uncle Kevin, for two years, was the uh, drummer, and then their cousin, uh, Kenneth Tornito, was the bass player. So there's my dad. Looks a little bit like Jimi Hendrix, huh? <laughs> um, so any, in, any memorabilia I could find, like uh, um, they had a couple of their set lists. So what you're seeing is an actual blown up set list of different songs that they played. Um, a little faux stage. <laughs> And uh, that image is actually the Marines version of the Maniacs. And then to top it off, I, want, I wanted to have a merch shop. So you can go to the merch shop, you can buy your socks with the Maniacs on them, hats and some limited edition prints. And so it was really great um, talking to my dad and I was sending him pictures and he doesn't know how to text. So anytime I send him something over text, he immediately calls me. <laughs> and he called me and he's like, oh, it looks really good. He was super happy. And uh, he said, there sure are a lot of images of me. And I said, well, yeah, it's kind of about your musical history. And, and then he said, well, where's the art? <laughs> and I said, the art is the story. <laughs> and he said, oh, oh, that's great. So that was sort of funny. <laughs> And then a the, uh, week after I left, um, the gallery director called me up and she said, something amazing just happened. This Marine who um, uh, retired here in Las Cruces actually uh, went to boot camp with your father and he brought in a bunch of books. And so he brought in this yearbook thing and here's my dad and there's that Marine. So it was pretty cool. And so my hope is that this then travels sort of like a tour for, for the maniacs, and I, it's definitely gonna go to the Jocelyn Museum in Nebraska next year. Um, this show just closed, but I um, curated a show at the Missoula Art Museum, focusing on um, Native women, and the artists in the show were Elisa Harkins, Tanya Lucan Linklater, Marianne Nicholson, and Tana Sultan, and I told them the Crow origin story about our history and our land, and then I asked them to share their side. And um, the Crows were once a sister tribe to the Hadatsa, and then we split from them 
and we traveled for about 100 years before we found Crow Country. And we called that split from our sister tribe, Beluga, and what that means is our side. So I asked the women to tell me their side. And so here's some of the work in the exhibition. We're in talks right now to maybe travel this show to Canada. Um, so just last year at the Q Foundation in um, Manhattan, I had an exhibition um, curated by Michelle Gradner. And I decided to focus on this event that happens on my reservation. I'm originally from Montana, and I grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation. And um, we have this event that happens every third week in August called Crow Fair. And the crows, and in crow, it's called umbux uh, bilua, which means where they make the noise. And um, Crow Fair was started in 1904. So my grandfather was born in 1907, and my grandma was born in 1920, and they attended Crow Fair their entire lives, my dad and then myself and hopefully my daughter. Um, and when my grandparents were born, they weren't born citizens, because Native people uh, weren't granted citizenship si ship until uh, 1924. So I, th I always think that's sort of interesting to think about. Um, so Crow Fair was modeled after the Midwestern fairs, and it was a way to assimilate Crow people into farmers. And so uh, they wanted the Crows to bring their livestock and um, their produce. And at that time, a lot of the ceremonial things were banned for all Native people like gathering in large groups or dancing, anything um, traditional to that culture. And so um, the Indian agents at the time lifted some of those restrictions uh, so that the crows would come to Crow Fair. And so part of Crow Fair, there's always been a parade. And so I decided to focus on that aspect. And what I did was I gathered all my family photos, as many as I could uh, gather, um, and then uh, the further I went back in time, I started looking at uh, historical archives, museum archives of photos. And I did as many of the decades as I could. And so here's a, a video of this, and hopefully it doesn't make you motion sick, but bear with me. And so the start, it starts in 2016. Um, most of these are iPhone photos, a lot of selfies. So at Crow Fair, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, we have this whole kind of system about bragging. And so as an individual, it's really looked down upon if you brag about yourself. And our, our tribe is um, split into seven clans. And so each clan has um, teasing cousins to that clan. So we're, get, we're getting into the 90s here. Um, and it, the purpose of the teasing cousins is to police um, the community. And so if you're caught bragging about yourself, they'll come and they'll publicly humiliate you. Um, the loophole to that, though, is you can brag as much as you want about other people. Um, and so what you're seeing a lot with these women on horseback is what they're doing is they're parading the war honors of the men and the family. Um, so you'll see that they'll have shields or they'll have uh, war staffs, things like that. Um, so that's the way to get around it. And the thing that I love to 
think about is the cars are also dressed exactly like the horses, so it's translated. So now we're into the 80s, and actually we just passed, this is the 70s. And these are slides that my father took, and my mom was going to throw these slides away because she was moving, and I, I got them. So luckily I did. There's these great images from the 70s. And I believe this pops into the 50s. And then the 40s, and this woman right here is my grandmother. And this woman right here with her arms out, that's my grandmother in the 30s. And we're into the 20s, and this little girl here in the polka dotted dress, that's my grandmother. And now we're getting into the 1910s. And this man right here holding the flag, he was our last primary chief of our tribe. His name was uh, Honeyku, Chief Honeyku. This guy with the bird on his head, his name's Medicine Chrome. He's one of my favorite chiefs. Now, what I like to think about, too, is all the personal photographs are all from a Crow's perspective. And when you get into this part of the timeline, it's all from a white person's perspective. Now we're in the 1900s. to end with this woman because she's a badass. But because we're also a matrilineal society, so everything's passed through um, uh, from your mother's side. And since my mother is white, I go by my grandmother's side. So here's um, some detailed images. And um, if I knew the individual's names, I would put their names on there. If I knew um, different um, things about them, I'd also write that on the timeline. And then I started with my daughter Beatrice because she's the next generation to carry this through. So a little bit more about Crow Fair. It's known as the TP Capital World and this coming August will be the 100th Crow Fair. It's open to everybody. About 50,000 people attended last year. Um, and every family has a camp that they set up. So this is our family's camp. Um, you're seeing a lot of these dresses that look like they had polka dots on them. Um, those polka dots are actually elk teeth. Um, and these are actually my stash of real elk teeth. And the reason why they're so special is because there's only two eye teeth per elk. And um, some of the dresses have 500 per side. So you're looking at a lot of elk. Um, the dress that we wear is called an elk tooth dress. And the teeth are adorned onto this wool fabric. Um, and the wool fabric typically, historically, came in three colors, a red, a dark, um, I'll play a little video, uh, a red, this dark blue, and a Kelly green color. And the more elk teeth you have, the more status you carry. Um, a lot of the men, uh, when they were children, would create sort of these dowries of elk teeth because it was the man's responsibility to dress his bride. So you didn't want your bride to have like a few handfuls of teeth, you know, that would so not be cool. Um, um, and then around uh, like early reservation period, turn of the century, elk in Montana were actually almost extinct. So you'll notice when you look at a lot of um, museum um, dresses that are in museums, the um, the information about the dress will typically say glass, um, wool, um, wood, or bone. And what it's saying is that the teeth are carved out of wood or bone, and now most of the teeth are all made out of uh, resin or plastic. And so th these are resin teeth. It still holds that um, same status. And so this is like what it looks like 
um, with all the accessories for an elk tooth dress. It takes me about an hour to put this on. And she dressed my daughter as well. And August, it's really hot, so there's a lot of crabby crow women. <laughs> you know? um, and this is what it looks uh, like on. And so also at Crow Fair, there is a um, powwow that happens, a dance. And so that happens throughout the day. Um, and then uh, there's a rodeo, so it still kind of harkens to the fair. Um, this is our uh, parade float here. We got 13 girls in that truck. It was awesome. And this is my daughter, Beatrice, and she's uh, riding horseback. And to put it in context, this is... <laughs> So I better see all of you at next pro fair. <laughs> um, I like to put this uh, little clip in here. Um, how many of you know who John Trudell is? Is any, anybody? Oh, that's good. Awesome. Um, I really love um, listening to John Trudell speak. Unfortunately, he's not with us any longer, but he was uh, part of the American Indian movement. He was an activist. Uh, he's a poet and musician. And he was in this documentary called Half of Anything. And he was asked this question, what is a real Indian? And um, I think I always knew this subconsciously, but it wasn't until I heard him say what he's going to say that it, it really kind of exploded for me. And so I'd like to play it to kind of set the tone for the rest of the lecture. What is a real Indian? Real Indians live in India. That's what a real Indian is. A real Indian won't eat a cow. <laughs> won't eat any beef. Real Indian. Yeah. All right. Um, and in the actual factuality of reality, there aren't any Indians here. And we're not even really Native Americans because we're older than America as a people. Right? We're older than America, and America is a concept that's been here two or three hundred years. Well, we're older than the concept. So I love to think about that. Um, and another thing I like to think about, too, is um, Buffalo, Bill, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. You guys know, you've, you've got, you have to have heard of that, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and City Bowl. And so where my reservation is, um, in the town of Crow Agency, which is where Crow Fair happens, right across, um, very near to where the camps are, is uh, Custer's Battlefield. And so, um, Sitting Bull was the one who kicked Custer's butt. And so I always grew up thinking of him as sort of the ultimate, authentic, native, you know, chief. And, uh, but when I thought about it, Sitting Bull had to play Sitting Bull in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. So even Sitting Bull had to play Indian at some point in his life. So that's also something just to think about as well. Um, so I left the reservation when I was 18 to attend um, Montana State University in Bozeman, which was about four hours drive from my reservation. And um, it was there that I started to take Native American studies classes. So growing up on the reservation, that was my normal. And I never really questioned like why we were on a reservation. So it wasn't until taking those classes that I learned sort of all these things that uh, I didn't ever question. And by doing that, I became interested in just studying the history of my own people and our relations to the US government. And so what you're looking at is a map of Montana, and um, these are all the different tribal nations that inhabited that territory. And the yellow is before contact, so that was Crow territory. And that was uh, 38.5 million acres. And this is our current reservation, which is 2.25 million acres. And when I was looking 
at this. There was a quote from one of my favorite chiefs, his name sits in the middle of the land, and he was responsible for telling the US government where Crow territory was. And he used this beautiful metaphor, he said, my home is where my teepee sits. And so the way that the crows set up teepees is we use these four foundation poles and then we set the rest of the poles on those foundation poles. So he took um, each of the four foundation poles and then placed them on the major migration routes that we took throughout the season and that mapped out that 38.5 million acres. And then when I took a closer look, I realized that Bozeman, where I was going to school, was actually crow territory. And I got very excited about that and I told my dad, that I want to let everybody know, the community there, that they're on Crow country. I want to honor my ancestors. And so he helped me harvest lodge poles, and we rigged them up, and we took them, and they're about 30 feet long. And um, I decided I would set teepees up on campus. So my first spot was in front of the art department. And so here are the four foundation poles, and here are the rest of the poles, and this is what a finished teepee should look like. And so for a crow teepee, to make a classic crow teepee, you want it to look like there's an inverted teepee on top of the teepee. So really long poles extending outward. And so I would go out and I would scout coveted territory on campus with the most worn paths, and I'd set my teepees up on it, and I would have it there for a few days, and then I would go look for other places. Um, and it was at this point where things sort of got interesting. So this was right next to a co-ed dorm. And it would take me eight hours to set these up. And I'd usually my mom would come and help me or I'd um, uh, bribe friends to help me. And so this particular one, I sat up, went home, came back. All of them were knocked down. And I thought maybe it was the wind. So I set it up again and then they were all knocked down. And then I decided I would just make this fortress structure with all the poles. Um, and they got knocked down. And then I was like, well, screw it. I'll just put it on the football field. <laughs> but the reason why I show you this piece is because this is pretty much um, the foundation of the way I work, where it starts off with sort of this question, and then this research, and then a project blooms from there. In 2014, I was asked to do a solo show at the Portland Art Museum in their Apex Gallery. And I decided I wanted to focus on one of our chiefs, his name's Medicine Crow. And sometimes I take for granted just um, knowing things and my audience not knowing things. But my last name, Red Star, comes from my great grandfather. So his name was just Red Star. And um, it was that generation, and Medicine Crow, that's just his name. Um, so you'll find descendants and they'll have that name, like Joe Medicine Crow, which was uh, one of our tribal historians who has passed away. Um, but when they put us on the reservation, then they took the head of household, which was a man usually, and they allotted certain lands to that individual and then their children or their wife was given their uh, name as a surname. Um, so, I decided to focus on Medicine Crow and these two particular images that were taken of Medicine Crow because uh, when I left the reservation, these images kept popping up everywhere. So in undergrad and then when I went to UCLA, I used to go to Whole Foods, um, it was the closest grocery store, and Honest Tea, do you guys know Honest Tea, had this image of Medicine Crow on it. So I'd buy that. It felt very comforting to have my Medicine Crow Honest Tea, um, or like a, I, in airports, I'd see him on books. Um, if you Google him, you'll see all sorts of artists um, making images of him. And so I wanted to dig into that. I, I wondered, like, do these people know who Medicine Crow is? Do they know that he's Crow? And then for myself, what actually happened that day when he sat down to take that photo? And what I found was that this these were delegation portraits um, that were taken in Washington, D.C. by a photographer named C.M. Bell. And uh, Medicine Crow, who's in his early 30s, traveled with five other chiefs um, to Washington, D.C. from Crow country. 
because the government was trying to put a railroad through a large chunk of our hunting territory. So they were there to fight for Crow land. And this particular trip, they were held there for a couple months, and that was sort of a normal tactic for the government if they could hold different native people there, because it wasn't just crows traveling there, it was other tribal nations. Um, they could maybe make them homesick and get them to sign things. Um, but they also took them on all these different sort of side trips too, which was interesting. So usually a delegation would have uh, certain prominent members um, and it would have uh, interpreters, so these two were the interpreters, usually an Indian agent, which was sort of like this babysitter. Um, and then um, on this particular one, there's this uh, man named Barstow, and he was um, the clerk, the tribe's clerk. And um, Barstow, when they came back to the reservation, asked Medicine Crow if he would draw um, from his memory the trip. So there are these wonderful drawings that are held in Bellings, Montana at MSU um, of Medicine Crow's drawings. So here's an image of the Capitol. And I love, too, his thinking, which is, you know, very indigenous. He's, he's marking it with the river there. He thought this was a chief, so it's got a war bonnet on. Three different types of boats. Great little fishermen fishing action. Three different types of trains. Looks like Abe Lincoln, doesn't it? Um, and then the other thing that I did was I, I started looking into each of the different chiefs and um, facts and history about them, what I could find, and what I realized, what they were trying to state through their clothing was how they became chief, a chief. And in order to become a Crow chief, there are four things you need to do. You need to be the first in battle to touch an enemy warrior, um, snatch a weapon from an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand co combat, steal a horse within an enemy camp, and lead a successful war party. And we were like excellent horse thieves. We had a lot of horses. When Lewis and Clark came through our territory, we stole all their horses. Um, so we were just really good at that. Um, so this uh, ermine or weasel on his arms meant that he captured a gun. And if he has that on his legs, that meant he captured a horse. This is a eagle feather. Um, it's a coup feather. Um, so coup is like a war honor, and that meant that he uh, touched an enemy in battle. So this is Old Crow. And Old Crow actually, this wasn't the first delegation to go. In 1873, there was a delegation and he was on that delegation. He's about 50 years old. Looks pretty good, huh? Um, this is Pretty Eagle. And through my research, I found out that he's actually my clan father. He's Pagan. We're known as the treacherous clan. We are also known to hate water. So it's kind of interesting. I live in Portland with all the rain. Um, but one of the things I found out about him that I didn't put two and two together was that um, when he died, um, the, the sort of honorable way to bury chiefs at that time was to put them in the back of a wagon box. And so he was buried in the back of a wagon box. Um, and then a few years later, um, this man came and dug up several bodies including his, and his body ended up getting sold, and um, the Natural History Museum in New York had it for like about 72 years. And then we were able to get it back, and his body came back in the 90s, and there's a place on the reservation called Pretty Eagle Point. And so I would go there as a kid, not having any idea, but that's why that's there. Um, this is Two Belly, so there are two, um, sort of sections of crows. There's the mountain crow and the river crow, and so he was a river crow. That's why he looks slightly different in like hairstyle. But he's wearing this really amazing coat that is modeled after um, military jackets of the time, really popular towards the end of the 1800s. And um, I was able to utilize some of the Native American collection at the Portland Art Museum, and they happen to have a crow jacket very similar to this. So it gives you a great idea of the tremendous like, color and vibrancy that you would see in those portraits. Um, this is um, Plenty Coup. So 
2012 and 2013, I moved back to my reservation from Portland and I managed Chi Plenty Coup State Park, which is on our reservation. Um, and I found out through this research that Plenty Coup, when he was in Washington, D.C., they took the group of chiefs on a, a side trip to Mount Vernon. And he was so enamored with Mount Vernon that he wanted to create a miniature Mount Vernon on the Crow Reservation. And so that's what Chief Plenty Coup State Park is. And it houses like all his personal objects, a log uh, cabin home, which was the tallest um, house for the longest while on the reservation. And a lot of his um, personal um, objects and other tribal members' objects. And, he, and he's buried there. And so the, the way his coup feather is on his head at this low point meant that he was the very first person to touch somebody in a battle. <laughs> and then Medicine Crow, I always love to point out um, that this right here is actually hair extensions. And so the men like to wear these really long hair extensions and they were made from people in mourning. So big thing for crows when people die is that you cut your hair off because hair is power. We actually have a chief named Chief Long Hair. And he had hair that was so long it could wrap around the base of a teepee. And that bundle's actually at Chief Plenty Coup State Park. Um, and so they would um, use sticky pine pitch and sort of weave these hairs together to create this really long hair extension. So I just imagine them walking away with their nice hair extensions. And so it attaches to this beaded sort of harness. Um, the other thing I always talk about is these hair bows. Um, and this one's actually broken. It's supposed to look like this. And in order for him to wear that, he had to overcome an enemy and slice their throat. So I love thinking about honest tea and a little throat slicer on there. <laughs> um, they took them to one of the first circuses. And so Medicine Crow did drawings of that. And they fell in love with these drawings. And I also fell in love with the way that he named some of the animals because a lot of these animals didn't exist in Crow country. And the Crow language is a very visual language. So the peacock is wonder tail, comes from above. And we have catfish, so that was no problem. And so at that time, um, I was trying to think of like, how can I have these? You know, I love these images. And there was an advertisement for um, a place that would take your kids' drawings and turn them into soft toys. And this particular company was in Australia. And so I took this uh, camel, which he calls an elk with a large back on him, um, and cropped it, sent it over, and this is what came back. And I kind of love this process of what they decided to keep and um, what they edited out. So here's a big snake with legs. And then we have mountain lions, so he just called it this lion a mountain lion. One of my favorites, the monkey, the man dog. And this is where you can tell Medicine Crow sort of kind of got a little bit hazy where he knew the zebra had something on it, but he forgot it was stripes, so he gave it dots. So at this time, um, I was working a full-time job. I'm also a single parent, so I raised my daughter 50% of the time. And um, so I was using any bit of time I could to make art. So I used all my sick time and all my vacation time. Um, and so this one night, I was working on all of these um, delegation portraits. And I had a, a stack of Xeroxes that I could sort of write notes on. And my daughter, Beatrice, wanted to play. I was like, oh, shoot, I can't. You know, I still have stuff to do. So I gave her a stack of these images. Um, and I said, just go mess around. And she came back and plopped this down. And I was still trying to figure out how to kind of make the show come from full circle. And I asked her, would you like to be part of the show? Because this really is about the next generation and how they're going to own and take care of this history. And she said yes. So I set her up with a little studio. 
and she produced about 20 drawings. And then um, she came to the open, opening with me, and on the way to the opening, she said she wanted to talk about her work. <laughs> and I was like, well, oh shit, I, I have to do this, right? Like, I can't like, just talk about my work and deny her. So I, I said, okay. And so she talked about her work, and she did an excellent job. And I realized that she has a, a gift for public speaking. Let's see if this will play. It's not coming up. Um, so she then brought, we had her class come, and she did a full tour with them. Um, and I wasn't able to talk about my work either, so she did the whole show. Um, the RISD Museum contacted me, and I did um, a project with them for their journal manual. And I decided I would um, do the 18. 73 Crow delegation, the first one. So I'll just show you a little video of that. And so you'll notice um, this is the first delegation to ever go to Washington, D.C., and it's got um, chief sits in the middle of the land. And you'll notice that each of the men have these red feather dusters. And so I was doing research on this project, and in their group delegation photo, all of the crow men are holding these feather dusters. And in my research, I found out that they took them um, for an, an extra, which it was written in their um, books, to a brothel house, and they took them to see a fan dancer. And the crow chiefs were so enamored by the fan dancer that they um, gave the fan dancer, their eagle fans, and she gifted them these feather dusters. So they took an image with these feather dusters, and they, when they returned to Crow Country, all the sub chiefs wanted feather dusters. So it started this big kind of fashion trend, and the trading posts then started stocking these feather dusters. So you'll find images like in that timeline of Crow Fair in the 1920s with men with feather dusters. It all stems from this hot evening in 1873. <laughs> Um, so after doing the show with Beatrice, um, we started a collaboration. Um, so we have worked together at several different institutions. Um, we've worked at the Seattle Art Museum, Portland Art Museum, and the Tacoma Art Museum. Growing up on the Crow Reservation. So the Crow, by placing all these other artists. Wendy doing hers, it looked portraits. I saw Wendy doing hers. It looked fun. I found it like uh, coloring sheet. Beatrice, them seven, added colored designs to another set of pictures. They became part of an exhibition of Wendy's work at Portland Art Museum. I would describe it purple, yellow, green, and orange, and blue, and and I would describe it as a work of art. I really try to open it up so that they can say, well, you know, that person's like a, a human. It's not just like a figure of the past. It's, this is a real human, that, and here's how it connects to us today. And then we can definitely you, do that Yeah, one. you could do it. Which, it looks I mean, easy piece. What are you going to wear? A blanket. Wendy is preparing to lead a tour of the Halb Family Collection at the Tacoma Art Museum as part of the museum's Native Arts Festival. Okay, and then okay. He, he's also got an axe. So you're gonna grab the axe. I think this axe looks more like the one he has. Okay. On the museum tour, Beatrice will dress up in fake Indian artifacts and recreate selected paintings. Wendy will provide deadpan commentary. Sort of like him? Let's see. Don't you think these are look alike? Except yeah. I'm like way colorful than he is. Yeah. Oh, so my one, favorite. Claw. Why is this one your favorite? That guy looks pretty funny. And I get to use my favorite prop. Okay, so do you remember when we're in the museum? You're not going to say a peep, right? Peep. <laughs> You'll be in the silent muse. Muse? What's a muse? A few weeks later, in Tacoma, the crowd is larger than Wendy had expected. It's showtime. 
one of the rules that the Howe family wanted when they wanted to purchase artwork is that none of the images in this exhibition would show any violence. So to make sure that we really shield ourselves from violence today, we are gonna wear our rose-colored glasses. So Beatrice, should we put ours on? This is one of our favorite pieces in the collection by artist E. Burbank. He actually painted over 1,200 Indian portraits and contacted 125 different tribes. This is our most prized possession that we have here. It had been sitting in a factory in China. It's rare because it has these multicolored eagle feathers. Just take a moment here, because this is really a beautiful piece. Um, we've also worked at the Seattle Art Museum. They had an exhibition called Indigenous Beauty. It was a Diker collection. And they had an open, uh, a public night, so we did a little intervention. Um, this is some of what was on display. And uh, what we decided to do was Beatrice would recreate a piece I did in 2006 called The Four Seasons, which were these dioramas um, with fake animals and um, she would wear her elk tooth dress. Um, and then we would then invite the public to come and take pictures. So, um, so I had her do everything that I did to create that body of work in 2006, which here is uh, Indian Summer from um, the Four Seasons series. So we did a lot of online um, shopping, online hunting stores, got this fabulous bear, it's, uh, my dog. Um, <laughs> Home Depot, AstroTurf, Michaels, Flowers. Um, so here we are setting it up in the museum and then Beatrice taking her pictures. And then when the public came, we had a, a camera unit set up that was uh, hooked up to this computer that then beamed it up to the second floor um, at the entrance. So when people took their photos, their photo would be uh, projected at the entrance and then they'd see themselves on display before they went and saw all the native objects on display. So here are some of our people. Um, we uh, went back to the Portland Art Museum in 2016 and participated in contemporary native photographers and the Edward Curtis legacy. And Edward Curtis came to Crow Country in 1908. So it was a great way for me to really access all the materials that he had on my uh, people. And so he had audio recordings and he uh, a lot of uh, writing and images. And what I noticed that a lot of his uh, the big portrait images, all of them were all men. And since we're a matrilineal society, we decided to make um, portraits, um, this body of work called Absalaga Feminist. So my uh, studio is in my living room. So this is us on our Ikea couch. And I also wanted to show a thing that Curtis couldn't at the time, which was the vibrancy and the color that we have. And uh, again, we invited B's class at that time to come, and she did a tour. Um, we did our first residency um, that straddled 2016 and 2017. It was um, at the Denver Art Museum, and it was a five month long residency. Sometimes I would fly there by myself, and then B would come with me. Um, and she said that she wanted to do a children's tour um, just for children. She, she had like an age limit, she said three to 12. And I asked her why, like, why stop at 12? And she said, well, when you turn 13, you get a bit weird. Um, <laughs> but the museum, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. We had to invite everybody. Um, so I, we set her up with a badge and then we let her loose and she selected um, different um, pieces. And if there was a docent or a curator, they uh, would educate her on the pieces and she gave um, three tours, each 30 minutes long. And she really got into this concept. Um, she wanted to create a whole tour guide outfit. So she drew this outfit and then I sewed it up for her. Don't ask me where she gets the style. <laughs> no idea where this is coming from. So here's some of her tours. And now I'll play a little um, video of that experience.
another aspect of my practice is working with my daughter Beatrice, and it's really wonderful that she can come here to the museum, and she's also a working artist doing her thing, and we're, we're collaborating together. I'm really interested in the uh, Crow women's objects, um, mainly because I, I, as a mother, want to pass things down to Beatrice, and I want to learn as much about how the women made a lot of the material um, objects. I discovered that uh, the museum hired WPA workers to come in in the like uh, 40s and all the way up into the 70s to come in and draw each of the objects on the catalog cards. And there are these exquisite drawings, watercolor drawings, that depict each of the objects. And so that's something that I was really drawn to because it's another artist who's had intimate time with each of those objects. So I'm really interested in maybe trying to find out who those artists were, more about that program, that important part of our history, um, and just kind of drawing a connection between them and, and my culture as well. I'm going to tour children as a child through the Western and Native galleries. So they were able to experience a child teaching them and also to be able to learn about Native culture, Western history, then maybe do some activities that may inspire them. Well, I think that sometimes it's easier to understand another child than you understand an older adult. And I just thought that maybe some children would be more comfortable knowing that this is a tour made by a child for children and maybe gain a new perspective on art. Um, and this uh, last um, collaboration that we did was at the Museum of Art at WSU Pullman. And this was really great because it was an institution that asked for us both to come, which was great. Usually the way it worked is I would tell Beatrice, I, I have, I've been offered this thing, would you like to do something? And she'll tell me yes or no. Um, so they had an exhibition called Contemporary Women Printmakers. And I had several works that I did at Crow Shadow Institute of the Arts. It's a, a, um, a residency where you get to work with a master printmaker. And it's located on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. It's one of my favorite artist residencies because it's the only residency where I've actually made work. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show just a, a video of sort of like how we kind of the process. So these 10 years old now, she's totally tweening out. Um, a little bit, uh, well, it's interesting. And she's really into these cat ears, so she wears cat ears every day. Um, but again, with this exhibition, she selected work. Um, we would sit down and do Do you want to go through that small archway? Because you, you have 30, I don't know if we should funnel through. Better. And then uh, we sort of figure out a flow of best way uh, to get the tour. And this particular tour was to uh, third graders and about 30 third graders. So it was pretty good. So I had to make her a whole new tour guide outfit. This one including cat ears. And this one is actually a slightly different color, if you didn't notice. project together in Newark, New Jersey at, at the museum there, the Newark Museum. So um, B said she would give a tour, but she doesn't want to just be known to be the, the tour guide girl. Um, so it's great that she's already thinking about being pigeonholed at age 10. Um, if you'd like to um, support B in s something of her own, she's got a comedy pod podcast called Bee's Big Laughs. 
And it just started, she released her first podcast, um, I think in January, and it's on iTunes, and I can play you. Hello, this is B from promo. B's Big Laughs, and I just wanted to give you a little preview of our up and coming episodes. I'll be interviewing Darcy Carlin. I think it tastes a little bit like mammal gelato. Kristen Shaw. The doorbell rang and I was getting ready to come see you. He said, there's a town card here for the 10 year olds podcast? <laughs> so that was just the Amazon. Abby Jacobson. <laughs> I did not know where you were going with that. I was like, lots and lots and lots and lots of what? And I'll also be interviewing our one male exception so far, <laughs> Mirabal Yankovic. I, when people ask me what my favorite parody is, I usually say white and nerdy. Oh, Just, I love that Oh, one. thank you. And Charlene Yee. I had a dream that you were interviewing me, but I got lost. <laughs> and it was like a maze, and it was blue, and the ceilings were made of sheets, and I was like, where are you? These new episodes will also have my new theme song in it that I made with Carrie Brown. So make sure to listen. So if you didn't know, B's my retirement plan. I plan to retire in 2020. She'll pay all my bills and I'm set. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you want to ask me a few questions, go for it. If you're shy, you can come up to me afterwards too. <laughs> Wendy, thank you so much for coming. Um, I I don't know if I heard correctly, but in the video that you shared, um, I think it might have been the Denver Art Museum. Um, I heard, and, and there was this moment when you be and 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 your the those joining your tour guide put on the rose colored glasses yeah. in reference to what I what I if I understood correctly was a stipulation. Um, from the funders yeah. of the exhibit that images of violence mm -hmm. not be used. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a really powerful moment for me in thinking about the way, the way that you so deftly um, uh, drew, drew attention to that choice. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how, like, how you came to that decision and also how you may have um, navigated other moments where uh, the institutions that you were working with might have pushed back on um, your experiences or, or the narratives that you were putting forth? Yeah, that's a great question. The Tacoma Art Museum's um, pretty good because they know that they have a dilemma on their hands. And so um, they house the Haub family collection and the Haub family is actually this German family from Germany who fell in love with the Pacific Northwest and uh, I think they actually have a ranch in um, Wyoming. What's that town with the Teton Mountains? You know what I'm talking about. Jackson, Jackson Hole. Yeah, um, probably the prettiest place in Wyoming. Is anyone here from, okay, good. Oh, okay, you're someone's here. I've been there. Okay. From there. Just talking trash about Wyoming. I felt like I can though, because I always drove through it to get to my grandparents' place in Colorado. Um, but so the Haub family, um, their love of like uh, the U.S., they fell in love with Western art and became these huge Western art collectors. And so they gifted their collection of Western art to the Tacoma Art Museum. And they also um, gave the Tacoma Art Museum a lot of money to kind of reconstruct part of their museum. And um, so the way that the museum has sort of dealt with that is they've invited native artists because they realize that that collection is doesn't have any native perspective. They do have five native artists that the Help family has collected, and they're all male 
Native artists, um, one of them being my uncle Kevin. He's a well-known painter. Um, and so um, they would invite, invite Native artists to either do commentary, um, engage with it somehow. And Western art isn't my favorite art. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to engage with the art and through doing research about them, um, they have this uh, thing about their collecting process and, and it said that they wanted to avoid any depictions of violence. So none of the, the work contains. And I thought, wow, that's so weird because all of the art is about manifest destiny. Um, so I found that really intriguing and I just wanted to comment on it by saying, we're gonna extra protect ourselves with these rose colored sunglasses um, as a joke because I find everything to be kind of funny. But I just thought, to me, that was a weird thing that they had, which um, I didn't know how to sort out, so that's how I sorted that out. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other question? Hi, um, thank you for coming here to visit us. Um, so cultural appropriation is like a hot topic on campus and in cultural like topics at large. I was just wondering, like, do you think it's ever appropriate? Do you think that as long as it's not malintended, it could be appropriate? Or like, what are your general thoughts? And obviously, like, there are many, many different cultures. You could even maybe appropriate from your own culture. Like, I'm half Hispanic, so I could like appropriate my culture or something. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a pretty hot topic. And I, I notice it comes up a lot with like native fashion. There's like a big native fashion movement and they're always talking about that. But I think what I've realized through, especially the research with the delegation stuff is that um, I'm always like, my limited like brain or, or thinking that things are sort of steadfast are not steadfast at all. So for instance, a good example of that would be those feather dusters where I might have you know, seen those and thought, well, that's a traditional item coming from somewhere, and then to find out it's from a brothel house. Um, so I think for me, um, another thing too is growing up, um, there's a whole thing about this is crow for, for like my generation, um, even my like dad's generation that it uh, was geometric designs for crow beadwork and um, seven colors. I mean, we still use that, but you couldn't go outside of that. Um, and then again, doing the research, uh, especially with the 1873 delegation, all the men in that delegation are wearing either Lakota or Cheyenne moccasins. And to me, that was a trip because I was like, wow. And so thinking about that, um, there wasn't this sort of pressure of being an authentic Indian um, that, that my ancestors had. And so when I think about that and have that sort of knowledge, then I feel this sort of freedom. And so I guess what I would say is that people just need to dig a little bit deeper than the surface. And maybe you know, people who are sort of being these appropriation cops, you know, I think you have to really do your research uh, before you kind of write this big article because um, it's a lot more interesting once you dig into it to kind of see where things uh, are coming from. So I guess that's where I, I, I stand with appropriation. Just ask lots of questions and do your research. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Jim. <laughs> um, in the same way that you're recaptioning the photographs, to, to sort of to jump on this question, as you're going through the objects of the museum, um, is there a moment of recaptioning recapt those objects, or are you finding sort of, um, uh, you know, um, moments where things are outside of a, a canon or outside of like a what would be expected of of crow um, objects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, a lot of things are labeled incorrectly too. So, um, and that, that's another thing is when you're set up, you sort of set up when you go into an institution that they're giving you all this correct information. And then when you dig into it, you realize, no, this is not correct. 
And so, for instance, at the Denver Art Museum, there'll be things that are labeled crow, and they're actually not crow. They're from another tribe. And I was doing some reading um, that a lot of times, because like when I talk about how we had a lot of horses, well, during like reservation period, a lot of other tribes would come and they would trade with us for horses. Um, and they would trade their uh, like beaded objects and things like that. So then those beaded objects, when some collector would come, a crow would sell them a Lakota pipe bag or moccasins, and then that item ended up getting into the museum and listed as crow. You, you know, so there's all these really kind of interesting things that are happening. Um, but some of my favorite stuff is just seeing um, like weird mixes of items. Like there was a crow cradle board with Betty Boop in it. And I was like, I love this, you know? So I love that sort of freedom and not getting stuck in sort of this rigidness. And I feel like that happens quite a bit with my generation. We're a little bit rigid and we're a little bit desperate to kind of hold on to authenticity um, without like really kind of realizing that there was a lot more freedom. Um, and, and that's how I think we've kept our culture. Um, our ancestors have kept that culture because there, there was that sort of freedom moving forward. And I'll do one more. I, I got stuck on the fact that there were no recordings of your father's music and I was wondering if uh, you ever heard it and if it got passed down and if you and Beatrice ever sing those songs or if the maniacs have any other um, presence in sound, not, not oh, only yeah. in photograph. I have no shot because I am tone deaf, um, so no one wants to hear me sing. But um, and I was wondering what kind of music it was too. Yeah, so it was a lot of like Motown, Ventures, um, a lot of blues they played. And my dad talks about this moment. Um, he said it was the best day of his life, and I'm always like, well, what about when I was born? <laughs> um, but they ended up playing the Battle of the Bands in Sheridan, Wyoming which is about an hour away from the reservation. And they had like a horrible number. I think they were number 25 or 30. And um, it was a pretty racist town at that point. And so they got heckled and were told to go back to the reservation. Um, and they ended up winning. And my dad said it was the most amazing time ever. you know. Um, and so all I have are really those stories and no recordings. And I'm hoping that maybe when this show continues to travel that things will happen. Like it was very interesting to have that Marine show up. So I'm hoping maybe there is something um, that might kind of come out about a recording or something like that. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.